All right. Shabbat shalom, everyone here and everyone who's joining us online again. Uh, we used to uh, broadcast our Bit Hadashah and Half Torah portions, and we stopped some time back, but I'm uh, just, feeling, just talking to Hashem about going ahead and getting going again doing it. So join me as we recite the blessing before reading the Half Torah portion. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher b'char ben v'aim tovim, v'eratsa v'devarechem chane emarim be'emet. Baruch atah Adonai ha'bocher b'torah u'v'moshe abdo, u'v'yisrael amo, u'v'in ve'e ha'emet v'atzerech amen. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen faithful prophets to speak words of truth, Blessed are you, Adonai, for the revelation of Torah, for your servant Moses, for your people Israel, and for prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. You may be seated. Today's Torah, por- or the Haftar portion, comes from the book of Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 1, verses 1 through 27. And it says, This is the vision of Yeshayahu, the son of Amotz which he saw concerning Yehuda and Yerushalayim during the days of Uz- Uziyahu, Yotam, Ahaz, and Yehizkayahu, kings of Yehuda. Hear heaven, listen earth, for Adonai is speaking. I raised and brought up children, but they rebelled against me. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's stall. But Israel does not know, my people do not reflect. O sinful nation, a people weighed down by iniquity, descendants of evildoers, immoral children. They have abandoned Adonai, spurned the Holy One of Israel, turned their backs on him. Where should I strike you next as you persist in rebelling? The whole head is sick, the whole heart diseased. (coughs) From the sole of the foot to the head, there is nothing healthy. Only wounds, bruises, and festering sores that haven't been dressed or bandaged or softened up with oil. Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned to the ground. Foreigners devour your land in your presence. It's, a desol- it's as desolate as if overwhelmed by floods. The daughter of Zion is left like a, snack, a shack in the vineyard, like a shed in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. If Adonai Sevaot had not left us a tiny tiny remnant we have become like Sodom we would have resembled Amora hear what Adonai says you rulers of Sodom listen to God's Torah you people of Amora why are all those sacrifices offered to me asked Adonai I'm fed up with burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls lambs and goats yes you come to appear in my presence But who asked you to do this? To trample through my courtyards. Stop bringing worthless grain offerings. They're like disgusting incense to me. Rosh Hodesh, Shabbat, calling convocations. I can't stand evil together with your assemblies. Everything in me hates your Rosh Hodesh and your festivals. They are a burden to me. I'm tired of putting up with them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. No matter how much you pray, I I won't be listening because your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves clean. Get your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Defend orphans. Plead for the widow. Come now, says Adonai. Let's talk this over together. Even if your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Even if they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of Adonai has spoken. How the faithful city has become a whore. Once she was filled with justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver is no longer pure. Your wine is watered down. Your readers are rebels, friends of thieves. They all love bribes and run after gifts. They give no justice to orphans. The widow's complaint doesn't catch their attention. Therefore says the Lord, Adonai Sevaot, the mighty one of Israel, 
I will free myself of my adversaries. I will take vengeance on my enemies. But I'll also turn my hand against you. I will cleanse your impurities as with lye and remove all your alloyed base metal. I will restore your judges as at first and your advisors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, faithful city. Zion will be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent by righteousness. Now the blessing after reading the Haftarah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, tzokol ha'olamim, tzarek b'chol ha'derot, ha'el ha'neeman, ha'omer ve'oseh, ha'mdeber u'makiyem, shekol devarav emet v'atzedek, neeman atah Adonai Eloheinu, v'nei emanim devarecha v'devar echad, Midavarecha ahor lo yashuv rekam. Ki el melek nemaan ve rakaman ata. Baruch ata donai. Ha el chaneaman becho devarav. Amen. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, rock of all eternities, righteous in all generations, the faithful God who says and does, speaks and fulfills, all of whose words are true. Faithful are you, Adonai, our God. And faithful are your words. Not one of your words turns back unfulfilled. For you, O God, are a faithful and compassionate king. Blessed are you, Adonai, the God who is faithful in all his words. Amen. 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 There is an idea all throughout Torah. But it comes up in specific ways. This idea, I want to know God, but by my rules, not his. Happens everywhere. You know, we deal with a lot of people in the body who they don't, they want to know God, but they don't want any rules. They don't want any instruction. They just want to know God in their own image, how they think they should know God. Israel, God's chosen people. We're given very specific instructions, and there's not that many of them compared to, if you look at all the things you could possibly do, compared to what God says not to do, not many, not many things. Uh, But we know the story, and we know, more so we know the ending, which is total rectification and reunification. The consequences of just the current state. That being said, I want to talk to you about just a few things in here. It says in verse number one, an ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's stall, but Israel does not know. My people do not reflect. It's a sad commentary on his people. Rashi, referring to where it says its owner or the word uh, kanehu. It's the one who affixes him to the plowshare for plowing by day. And since he is accustomed to him doing this, he knows him. The dull donkey, however, does not recognize his master until he feeds him. This is a lot what we talk about within the body. The idea of much of the body doesn't recognize God until he does something for them and provides for them. That's when they finally recognize him. Or he does something for them. As opposed to what Hashem wants. Us to recognize him based on what he's asked us to do. And being obedient to do what he calls us to do. And that's the foundation of our relationship. Not what we get for him, from him, but what we do for him. Amen. Rashi goes on to say, Israel was not intelligent like the ox to know when I called him and said, Israel will be your name, Genesis 35.10. And I informed them of my several, several of my statutes, yet they deserted me, as is related in Ezekiel 20.39. Let each one go and worship his idols, even after I took them out of Egypt and fed them the manna and called them, my people, the children of Israel, 
they did not consider even as a donkey. Another explanation that has been rendered is an ox knows its owner. He recognizes his owner so that his fear is upon him. He did not deviate from what I decreed upon him by saying, I will not plow today. Neither did a donkey say to his owner, I will not bear burdens today. Now these creatures who were created to serve you and are not destined to receive reward if they merit it or to be punished if they sin, do not change their manner, which I decreed upon them. They just served and did what they were made to do with no idea of ever getting a reward for it. This comes back to what you're talking about, right in the center of it. Are they earning anything? No. Are they doing it because they want to earn something? No. And instead of using his people as the example of what to look at, he's saying, look at this beast of burden who comes and puts his head down and takes on the yoke and goes and plows. That's its job. And he recognizes the master, who its master is by doing the work that his master has asked him to do without even thinking about what is he, what am I going to get out of it? Big difference, isn't it? Really big difference. Israel, however, Israel, yeah, however, if they merit received reward and if they sin are punished. Ibn Ezra, he says, the ox and the donkey are mentioned as animals which are in constant use among people. Talks about this idea of the word avos, um, which translated into crib is a place where the donkey's food and that's the idea of the donkey who only knows his master because his master gave him something now we've been in society for a long time and in part of the body of messiah that that's what it's about it's about what can i get from god Within Judaism, the idea has never been about that, in particular on Shabbat. This is why we don't come with our hands looking for something on Shabbat. We come to give, we come to do on Shabbat. We come on Shabbat. If there's a, you have a big emergency, life or death, okay, that's one thing. But all this other stuff about trying to gain and trying to, not within Judaism. And they both go on to say that Israel... did not know. They are therefore in their character inferior to the cattle or the ox. What a statement. What a statement. Basically, they didn't know. They're not recognizing who God is by just doing the work that he said to do like even the ox does. The ox just comes and works and is obedient to the master or Israel is not. So the idea, their character is inferior to that of the ox or the, the cow. It continues in verse 4, O sinful nation of people weighed down by iniquity, descendants of evildoers, immoral children, they have abandoned Adonai, spurned the Holy One of Israel, turned their backs on Him. So this brings up your question from earlier. Is God obligated to continue to bless them and do the things He promised to do if they were walking righteously or not? No. He wouldn't run, no, no, right? No. Does that mean that he doesn't love them? No. So you can see, I'm, I'm glad you, we get a little better understanding of this. He continues in verse 9, he says, If Adonai Sevaot had not left us a tiny, tiny remnant, we, have be, we would, would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Amora. This has nothing to do with the typical things that are said about Sodom and Gomorrah, why it was destroyed. It has to do with them becoming stingy and treating people wrong, which I talked a little bit about a few weeks back. That's what he's talking about here. But this idea of a tiny, tiny remnant, that's why the Jewish people can go, and there's not many of them. They're almost brought to the brink of extinction. But there, they come back. How is that? The Jewish people in Europe were brought to a place of almost extinction where nobody was, many weren't practicing 
Torah. But there are a few groups, in particular Chabad, and the rabbis of Chabad who started teaching the Jewish people, come back, continue to practice Torah, those who, who are, are left. And it's just a tiny, tiny remnant. But we owe a lot of gratitude to those in the Jewish community who helped the Jewish community where Gentiles couldn't or wouldn't to even get to the place where we are today. See, again, God sees things outside of time and space. He's not looking at one little prick of time and judging everything by that one little. You know, you made a bad decision last week. I'm going to judge your whole life by that one decision you made. Or you, made a, you did a great mitzvah last week. So I'm going to judge your whole life. No, he sees the whole thing. So don't be so hard on yourself when you fall. Don't be so happy with yourself and, ooh, look what I just did. <laughs> you just keep on going steady, right? Then he gets to verse 11. I want to go through. Why are all those sacrifices offered to me? Why does Israel bring sacrifices to Hashem? This is really important. Give me some reasons. What's the first one? Well, but this, even when there was a temple. These are the, that's the liturgy, but these are the temple. Does, yeah. Oh, because he said to, right? So he said to, and we know that some of the offerings, um, you know, there's a few for sin, but most of them aren't for sin. They're just out of obedience. Um, but he's saying, why are all those sacrifices offered to me? Well, because he said so. That's one. But look what he says about them. If we know he told them to do it, that's why they did it in the first place. And then he says here, the, the uh, second part, it says, I'm fed up with burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats. Is he saying that he wants to end the sacrificial system that he implemented? No. So what is he saying? And? And? And in truth. So look at, if you look at spirit, you get this idea of outside of time and space, what's going on inside of you. And truth is more of a natural thing, what you're doing with an offering. You can look at it like that too. So it's not enough just to bring the offering if inside your heart's not right when you're bringing it. And Yeshua talked about all this. So for those people who use this verse and say, oh, look, God doesn't like this bloody sacrificial system. I'm sorry, he's the one who created it. You don't understand it. That's why it looks as bad as if he didn't like. So basically when they say that, they're saying that the priesthood in particular, or all of them, Israel, but in particular the priesthood should be vegetarians. You don't know what the priests would eat if there was no animals to eat, among other things. But that's a big one right there. The, high, the priesthood would starve and the offerings that had nothing to do with sin would cease as well. We've got to quit all, automatically connecting the offerings to sin. Are some of them connected to sin? Yes. All of them connected to sin? No, not at all. And again, he's talking about the covenant of the people. Don't bring an offering to me to try and draw near when your hearts are far from me. How biblically were the children of Israel, and by extension, everyone, what mechanism was given to them to allow them to draw near to Hashem? Sacrifice. So does that mean we can't draw near to Hashem now? Talk about that. How so? How can we? Okay. So then we can commemorate we're back to the same thing. We can commemorate what was lost, but it's diminished. It's not the same, but it's the best we can do, right? Mm -hmm. And this is why in that scripture you brought up, it says, it says something to the effect of, um, um, if you can look that up, actually, if you know where it is, it's talking about this idea. So the least we can do is to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's like the minimum we can do is offer ourselves as a as we're commemorating 
the sacrifices that are no longer. Do you have it right? Yeah. Yeah, do you have, read real quick, and I, I see back there, Linda. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we always see, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Right. He does. Yeah. Yeah. And but and even in the context of that, he's not saying, if you do this, we're going to end the sacrifice. And I know you're not saying that, but this is the kind of things that people would say yeah, that he's doing that. Exactly. So he's saying, you know, it's almost the same way he's talking to. Then when he says, hey, you know, you tithe even down to your mint, mm -hmm. but you forget the weightier things of love, right? So is he saying that they shouldn't give? No, but he's saying don't look upon that as that's the big thing and you're missing these big old things over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it's sort of like this been one of the commentaries throughout the scriptures because it really talks about how the, the, the Pharisees, they broaden their robes. Right. Exactly. All this sort of thing. And it's the same thing yeah. with the sacrifice. Look at me, it, I'm so wonderful. Right. Look at how much I'm giving. Exactly. I'm doing it all the time. Right? So again, I just want to pound this in. Should they is it okay for them to do the things they did? Yes, but the problem is that they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. So is it okay to have long zitio? Sure. Was it okay to say prayers to people here? They were called to do that. They had to, but not for the right the reasons they were doing it. And this is the big thing in people do not understand <clears throat> what Old Covenant and New Covenant means because the New Covenant, as he says, I will write my commandments on your mm -hmm. heart. So right. it's worshiping from the heart. And mm -hmm. this is what we're talking about right now. Yeah. So Right. The widow with her might, you know, the husband right. was putting in money and it's like, hey, no big deal, it's yeah. really wonderful, and the widow was like, this is really yeah. a sacrifice for, for her. For her too. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. And you know, with that too, he's when that happened, you see all the ones... The, reason, the implication in there is that the reason why this poor lady only has that to give is because she hasn't really been getting what she's supposed to get from those in charge at the temple, but yet she's still trusting God and not trusting in man. And she's doing it in front of them, and they don't correct themselves, and they don't repent and say, hey, you know, we didn't take care of this. They're, they're watching Messiah watch this happen, and they know in their hearts they did wrong, but they did, didn't repent and didn't make it right. Heart issues. So we continue here. I want to skip forward to uh, verse 17. Actually, uh, verse 16. Wash yourselves clean. Get your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. Judaism is all about doing good. Yes, it is quit doing evil. However, there's an idea and understanding if you focus on doing good and doing the mitzvah, you won't have time to do evil. If you're studying Torah, you won't have time to do whatever, you name it. That's more the idea. If you show up on Shabbat, then on, if it's Saturday and you're out doing something else, you could be out sinning or you can show up on Shabbat, right? Same kind of an idea. Seek justice, relieve the oppressed, defend orphans, plead for the widow. Basically do the mitzvot. Here's another scripture that's typically used a lot out of context or without an understanding of what it's talking about. Come now, says Adonai, verse 18, let's talk this over together. Let's reason together. We hear so much talk about, oh, that's God created this or that's man created this. No, it's always been a partnership. And it's always been about God and the authority, the, the, um, the, authority of the Jewish people that God put on earth to work together. 
Come, let's sit down, let's talk, let's break bread, let's talk about it. Not let's break up, no, let's break bread. Let's talk this over together. And he says, even if your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Even if there is crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. This comes up in the book of Joshua too, I believe. What's he saying? We're back to what you said earlier. Is God, you're talking about the love of God? Well, look, he's saying, even if you're so bad, you're, you're as red as crimson, I'll make you, if you'll come and be obedient, and we can reason together and work this together, I'll make you white as snow. Even if. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Quick pause. What land? Who is he talking to? Talking to Israel. And what land is he talking to that has something good to eat in it? The promised land. If you're willing and obedient, I'll get you to the promised land. You can eat all the good thereof that's waiting there for you. And we talked about the nations who they had to go through. We see that. We see that in Scripture, the ones they had to go through in order to get there. What we don't see are the ones that just said, hey, I'm not messing with them. I'm going to leave them alone and let them go through. This is where the Gentiles come in today. There's two. There's a lot of people, a lot of groups of Gentiles, in particular believers, who will, thank you, who will stop the Messianic movement, stop Jews from, we've got a, uh, someone in the synagogue, a rabbi, who the city that he's in, they keep on turning down their requests for to open a synagogue. Why? They're getting in the way of them opening a Messianic synagogue in the area. But they don't say that, but that's what they're doing. This is where I, this is a thing that offends a lot of people, but this is where Christianity gets in the way of Judaism and Messianic Judaism, who's trying to do something to bring Messiah back for everybody, is by stopping. Leave them alone. You know, Christians, when we talk about the Gamliel, when he says, look, Christians need to look at the Messianic movement and Judaism like Gamliel did concerning what to do with the disciples who were teaching about Messiah. If what they're doing is not of God, it's going to fall apart. Nothing going to come of it. Leave us alone. If what we're doing is of God and you get in the way of it, you're going to find yourself doing what? Fighting against God himself. And we see this idea, it's already talked about in verse 9, if Adonai Sevaot had not left us a tiny, tiny remnant. We're a part of that tiny, tiny remnant of Gentiles and some Jews who are doing what? Receiving Messiah and practicing Torah and are grafting ourselves into Israel for the benefit of everybody. Not because there's something, we're going to get something special because we're messianic. No. Not at all. We're like sacrificing to. It'd be a, it's a whole lot easier to swim downstream than swim upstream. Yep. Especially in the river in Yosemite this time of year with all the <laughs> snow melts. I tried to swim upstream and I went like I didn't. I went backwards. No way. But that's what it's like. So again, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about the land of promise. Now, is it a good practice for everyone to be willing and obedient? Absolutely. Can you claim this blessing as your own? No, not if you're not Jewish. If you're a Gentile, you can claim to be partakers of it by receiving Messiah and by grafting yourself on Israel. Then you become one with Israel. Then you're grafted into those who the promise is given to and you can receive from it. It's like we talk about the idea of the, uh, the party at someone's house. If we're connected and grafted into Israel through Messiah, we then have access to the blessings of Israel. But if you do not graft onto Israel, then quit trying to steal what is not yours and take from what was given to others as your own. Yeah. What does that look like physically? Do you have to go through a conversion process? No. No, that looks like, you've got to read Rabbi's book, the Rivka Remnant. So what that looks like is staying, if you're a Gentile, be Gentile. Yeah, exactly. But when he was talking, he was talking more to along the line of um, of uh, those who are Messianic Jews 
and Jews who hadn't received Messiah, about them intermarrying and different things. But as it relates to Gentiles and Jews, no, come in and graft yourself in. The best example we have is Cornelius. Okay, so here he was. I mean, he was an enemy of Rome, but they looked upon him as a righteous Gentile. Why? Because he practiced Torah. I'm sorry, he was with Rome, thank you, an enemy of Israel. But Israel looked at him as a righteous Gentile. And you see, I think it's in um, the works of, uh, of Josephus, he talks about how he gave a lot of money to build the synagogue in Capernaum and Capernaum. And he, he offered prayers. He was praying during, I think it was Mincha, during the afternoon. And it says his, his prayers came up to, to God as a sweet-smelling aroma. Why? He was praying like a Jew at the right time. And at that time, Messiah was around, had come and gone. And so who did God send to him to, so he can receive Messiah? You know, he, what's that? Yeah, but this is more so what I'm getting at. You know, he didn't send him the pastor from the First Baptist Church downtown Jerusalem. Who did he send him? He sent him a Jew who knew Messiah. He allowed a Jew to do a Jew to do what only a Jew can do. What they're supposed to do to live. And Cornelius, he didn't. He, he, he God, that's fine. <laughs> Cornelius received him. Look what happened to the Ethiopian eunuch. Some people say that they, he was Jewish. He, there's, in, there's information about, um, uh, about the Queen of Sheba and about um, uh, Solomon. Thank you. But they were still Gentiles practicing Judaism, but they were not really part of the house of Israel, but they probably had some understanding. They had enough understanding to come to Jerusalem and to seek understanding. And who did Hashem send to this Ethiopian eunuch? He sent him a Jew. He sent him Philip. And he translated him. Remember, he translates him from one place to another. And Philip is walking and he just happens to walk by. the. And there he is. He's reading from the scroll. So he's in Jerusalem or in Israel. And he has a desire to read from the scroll. And he was sent by the queen, of, um, the queen of Ethiopia to come and to gain understanding and whatnot. And look what he says. Philip asks him, hey, do you know what you're reading? He's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And he says, no, I don't. The most wonderful words the Gentiles ever spoken in, his life, in Scripture, he says, how can I know if I have no one to teach me? I, I get shivers going through me when I hear that. This is why I love Rabbi Shapiro so much and Rabbi Bernstein. Because they do so much that you guys will never know to take care of me and to take care of the community and everything you're doing all over the world. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Well, I mean, it was different because when Ruth did it, she did it solely by practicing Torah and becoming one with Israel. And basically saying, I'm leaving all my life behind. I see you back there. Um, post -mes when Messiah came, then it, it changed only in that the Gentiles could come in straight through Messiah. But the same process was the same to come back to Israel, come back to the house of Israel. And there's a pattern there in the story of the, um, uh, the prodigal son. You have one son who's at home with the father, who's doing right, basically practicing Torah, the older brother. But you have the younger brother who's like the Gentile who just leaves toward nothing to do with it. He goes all the way out, and he finds himself doing the most unkosher thing you can do. He's not eating pork, but he's eating like a pig, with the pigs. He says, what am I doing? I know better. If I go back to the house of my father, the house of Israel, my father's going to be waiting for me. He's going to kill the fatted lamb and celebrate me coming back to the house of Israel, to my home. And he does. And guess who doesn't like it? Big brother doesn't like it a whole lot. He's, I'm, I'm your dad serving you and, practice, and practicing Torah. He's coming back. What do, you, what do you mean you want him to accept me? Or, or Excuse me. You want me to accept him into our home. He's filthy. He's unkosher in every way. And he takes the best and gives him and brings him back in. 
So you see the house of Israel having to humble itself to accept the Gentile in, but the Gentile having to repent and come back to the house of Israel. And they both have to work together or the family is incomplete. The family is broken apart and separated. Yeah. Yeah. During the, the time of Solomon. Yeah. And then with this tent, this year we talked about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. They were the first nation mm-hmm. to become Messianic Jews. Mm-hmm. And they have the oldest. Uh, right. They, they, whatnot right. Of It's close, it's, close to yeah, the, it's, yeah. Like I said, it's a form. Exactly. It's like Arabic, yeah. Aramaic, Hebrew, Hebrew. and the Ethiopian. All right. The same mother tongue. Yeah. And Ethiopia is the only nation mm-hmm. in all of Africa that has not been under the yoke of a European nation. Yeah. And we know there's only one reason for that to happen. It's the yeah. blessings of Hashem upon them. them. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so the thing about them is that every, uh, that's all true. The rest of that is that they don't practice halakha and they have gone and gotten to other things too. There's a mix of it. But see, this is everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not just Israel has they, the house of Israel mix. There's constantly pagan stuff that they were doing. But the idea, yeah, exactly. One day we see in Zephaniah chapter 8, I believe, is when you, when you see Ethiopia. And you would see a lot of sub-Saharan Israel come together with the Jews and come back to Israel. And they start to be able to reclaim um, their place. But they're no longer Jews. Um, but there's a lot of Jews like that who have left Judaism and who are coming back to be regrafted in to the house of Israel. Um, that's a conference I do with Rabbi Shapiro in Denver, the Shoulder to Shoulder Conference. And that's... I just said mute myself. Um, because he's dumped millions of dollars into Africa, starting synagogues everywhere. And that's why we as a small community have been a big part in starting a little a messianic synagogue in the middle of Uganda that we support from, I mean, dirt, from nothing. And so that's why the things we do is what we do. That's why everything we support is just messianic. Not that we don't like Christian causes, but there's 50 million Christian churches out there. If they can't support that, then, I mean, my gosh. And no one wants to support the Messianic ministries. That's our focus. We do the best we can with what we have. Yeah, go ahead, brother. We can't join the covenant of Abraham. Right. Circumcision. So the way that works is, for one, you'd have to renounce Messiah. That's not good. But after three generations, you would be accepted. So your grandchildren would be. But still, um, you, there's no need. The biggest thing, there's no need for it because we have Messiah. If this was pre-Messiah, that's a different thing. Post-Messiah, that's, you don't, there's no need to. Um, that's a big thing going on now with people trying to um, convert. No, don't convert. You, gotta, you don't need to do that. Just be Jewish. And again, who's watching out there, if you want to get some, a book that talks about this, get Rabbi's book. It's absolutely incredible. You'll have a better understanding of who you are and why you are and then what your call is and what lane you're called to run in, and that's it. And then you can be happy to see everyone else's successes next year. You don't have to try and be someone or do something you're not called to do. You just be you and do what he's called you to do and then help the house of Israel to come back. Um, So let's finish up here. Let me see where I left off here. In verse 21, it says, How the faithful city has become a whore. Once she was filled with justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers, exclamation point, your silver is no longer pure. Your wine is watered down.
One of the commentaries says your silver has become as dross or dross. That's what's, the, that's what's burned off. That's the junk. That's the dirt, the, the contaminant within the precious metal that's just burned off by the heat. And that's what your good stuff has become, right? Rashi said, he said that they would make copper coins and plate them with silver in order to cheat people with them. And concerning your wine is diluted with water, Rashi also says this means that it's confused or it's mixed up. Uh, Ebenezer said concerning thy silver, he says it's a metaphor for your judges and your princes. And he says that because the verses uh, followed by thy princes are rebellious. And concerning the silver become dross, the best of the people were like dross. The best, your best people are like the stuff that we're trying to burn off. The best of the people are like what needs to be burned away to purify the silver and gold. Basically, the pure heart to serve Hashem is gone. And because of this, you guys remember what wine represents biblically? It always represents one thing in the Bible. No, it doesn't, no. No, but I'm glad you said that because that's where a lot of people would go. It always represents joy. Like we see the wedding of Cana when Yeshua makes the water into wine. Um, he does the exact opposite. He takes something, water makes it into something that's wine. He takes something that is ordinary, he makes it into something extraordinary or joyous. But listen to this, and I want to end here. Because they're not keeping Torah, their joy is watered down. And so my message today is if your joy is watered down, you may want to ask yourself, are you trying to get up when you fall and continue to practice Torah and teach others to do so? What a blessing. I got a call yesterday, our text on our congregational cell by a nice lady. She may be watching. If you're watching, I'm glad you're watching. And she was trying to lead me to a website that has this teaching basically that is saying, she said, oh, we're not putting a date on anything, but that's what it's proclaiming. They believe that this date's such and such. So they believe there, there's a teaching out there that says that the rapture is going to happen on the 9th of Av. And I just, you know, I was trying to work and we just got back from vacation trying to get things done and trying to get ready for service. And I kept having to text and I thought, you know, Finally, I said, you know what? I said, give me a call on the 10th of off, and let's talk. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm not trying to be smart or trying, but that's not, you, you mix, you're trying to take, this is what happens when Gentiles grab a little piece of a little Torah knowledge and try and just make something and run it, and they put stuff out there so other Gentiles say, oh my gosh, look, and it's all over the internet, and none of it amounts to much. And I said, who's your rabbi? Or your, um, your pastor. So she brought up a name of a pastor. Oh, well, such and such. And he's somewhat messianic. I don't want to mention his name. But he still is really close linked to the church. She brought up the name. And I said, oh, I know him. He's my friend. And I said, I know what he teaches. He teaches such and such. But you're trying to take something and call me the 10th of off. That's it. I don't want to. You know, because you know, some people they're not going to believe something until it's just proven to them. But if you're going to start believing all the stuff, people putting names and or times and names and all this, that's a spirit trying to cause problems. That's trying to say, look, I know something you don't know, and look, look at me. That's the exact thing that he's talking about. Quit doing that kind of stuff. Come together with the whole house of Israel and how and how and how things are supposed to be done. How they've agreed upon it should be done. It doesn't make anything else up. It makes it very easy not to have to do something different. Amen? Amen. All right, so we're going to move on to our Brit Hadeshah portion. We recite the blessing before reading the Brit Hadeshah. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Netan Lanu Mashiach Yeshua Vechara Berot Shel Habri Hadeshah Baruch Atah Adonai Noten Habri Hadeshah Amen. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe. You have given us Messiah Yeshua, 
<clears throat> and the commandments of the new covenant. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the new covenant. Amen and amen. Would you like to come up and read? I'm almost through and I have most of my voice. Baruch Hashem. Second two. Seeing the crowds, Yeshua walked up the hill. After he sat down, his Talmudim came to him, and he began to speak. This is what he taught them. How blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. How blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How blessed are the meek for they will inherit the land. How blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. How blessed are those who show mercy, for they will be shown mercy. How blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How blessed are those who make peace, for they will be called sons of God. How blessed are those who are persecuted because they pursue righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. How blessed are you are when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of vicious lies about you because you follow me. Rejoice, be glad, because your reward in heaven is great. They persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. And now the blessing after reading the Brit Hadashah portion. Amen. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe. You have given us the word of truth and planted within us everlasting life. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the new covenant. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, about two years ago, we have a belt business for those of you who know what we do and I had a customer back east who had who um, he was uh, he would certain type of belts he bought and so we were his supplier and so we did some things to help him and so through all of this we got to know each other well he had a Jewish name now, okay this is a young Jewish guy and so we talked and different things, got to talk about scripture. He knew what we, what we would do, etc. I thought he was a Messianic Jew. Turns out he's more along the line of, I'm a Christian, okay. But some very extreme group who was predicting dates. And I don't remember the day it was that they said Messiah is coming back. But we were in contact, and I said, okay, hey, do you want me to go ahead and place your order that you normally would place? Or, Oh, no, no, I don't need that anymore. Okay, well, maybe you don't need, you're not selling as many. No, 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 it's not that. You know, he said, uh, Messiah's coming back on such and such a date. And so I'm running my business until the day before that, then I'm shutting my whole business down. And I said, what? You know, it, it caught, totally caught me off guard. And I said, no, brother. I said, that's not, no, who are you listening to? And so he got kind of mad and offended. And he said, well, you're saying things from a Jewish point of view. I'm saying it from a Christian point of view. And I thought, oh, boy. So I said, all right. And I said, hey, I said, call me the next day. Never heard back from him. I've tried to get a hold of him. But see, when you start doing that and it doesn't happen, you, you know, it's like, what are you going to do? do you, it's like you're down a one-way street. You've lost all credibility, and you've you know, you got to repent from that kind of stuff and turn back. So there's a way to come back to God, repent and come back and quit doing that kind of stuff and quit getting a hold of somebody on Facebook that has a bunch of followers, and, oh, i got to listen to them because they know they just paid somebody to do a website, and they just slap something together, and you get what you get. I've got a picture someone showed me. There's a guy right over here in Stockton. He says he's Messiah. So he's got a big old following right here in Stockton. 
I'll show you the picture during Onig. And I thought, you know, and sadly, in the black community, there are different messianic problems. In the Hispanic community, there's problems that are kind of associated with, you know, with that group. In the Caucasian messianic community, there's problems associated. And it's sad to see people divided up racially with a bunch of nonsense in each group that you just say, you know, you just messed up the whole, there's people within that group who want to know the truth, but you just messed it up for them. And that's the kind of stuff that we deal with and Rabbi deals with. And so I just bring it to your attention so you don't think that I'm just making things up. You know. Um, anyhow, let's keep on going, shall we? Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, the Sermon on the Mount. Yeshua, it says, seeing the crowd, Yeshua walked up the hill after he sat down. His Talmudian came to him and he began to speak. This is what he taught them. Someone say, this is what he taught them. Notice this next verse doesn't say he taught them about salvation. Doesn't say that. He says, how blessed are the poor in spirit for what? The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Pause for a quick second. Yeshua always taught about the kingdom of God. He always taught Torah. And he never used the holy name of God. The holy name of God never comes up in the Brit Hadashah. Why? They didn't use it. They hadn't used it for hundreds of years. And regular people didn't use it anyway. It's not a point of whether or not you know how to pronounce it. It's whether you're supposed to use it. But he intentionally says something that you see all through Scripture. He could have said, for the name is theirs. But he does, he, he changes, he doesn't want to say the holy name of God, so he says, for the kingdom of heaven. Whenever you see this idea, the kingdom of heaven, the outstretched hand, the outstretched arm, what's the word, Casey? Circum, say again? Circumlocution, it's using a name or a phrase to say something you, you know. There's an, another, yeah. It's, it's understood within Judaism that because he was basically practicing Judaism. Um, I mean, he could have said Adonai here. He could have even said my father here. But the idea of saying the kingdom of heaven is a way that's known of not saying. Um, there's an English term I'm thinking about too. Um, I'll re remember the term. That's the same way. You don't want to say something. Euf a euphemism. Okay. So there's euphemisms for all kinds of things that you can think of. Um, and so, you know, like, let me think of something that's, if, give me one that I can think of that's, uh, you know, well, I'm, not, I'm trying to think ones that actually can be used on Shabbat that are, <laughs> but there's euphemisms. Most euphemisms, you're trying not to say either, in this case, it's the holy name, but a lot of things, it's something very bad or very negative. You're trying not to say. Um, so that being said, this statement within rabbinic Judaism would have uh, been an outrage to the leadership who was there. Why? Why? Anybody have a thought about that? Because within Judaism, being poor in spirit was connected to being poor in mitzvot and understanding. Back to what you talked about right here. When you're serving God, you're full of everything. You have the fullness of shalom in every way, right? When you're not, not so much. And it would never be a cause for someone to speak a blessing over someone, but it would be a cause for a cursing. Look at how things, look at your poor in spirit and your poor and your this and that. It's because you're not serving God. Because if you are, then you're connected to the blessing and it would be upon you. But Yeshua comes along and he's consoling Israel and their poor state spiritually and even naturally. And we look at the long suffering of Hashem towards his people. 
He didn't just give up on them. He sees them in their bad situation. He sends Messiah. Messiah says, you who are in poor in spirit, I'm basically, come up, make an aliyah. You know, come back up to where you should be and receive the blessings that should be upon you if you're doing the mitzvot. Yeah. It has some, not all, and the things are always connected to the, um, it's, you can't look at it as an individual thing. You've got to look at it as the whole community, the whole house of Israel. Well, if you look at this idea and it's saying, um, how blessed are the poor in spirit, he's not talking to an individual. He's talking to a group. The ma- yeah, the mass is the, the whole. I mean, there may have been people there who are rich, Presumably, it wasn't necessarily all just, just, but you see the, the majority, that kind of thing. And this just comes to the same point, Hashem will never turn his back on his bride Israel. I was trying to explain to the lady yesterday some of the things she was saying. I said, what you're saying is anti-Semitic. It's anti-biblical uh, Semitism. It's replacing the bride with the church. And she said, oh, well, you know, Scripture says that Jesus is the bride of the church and that God, I'm sorry, uh, the church is the bride of Jesus and the Jews are the bride of God. And I thought, oh gosh. And I'm try- I said, no, no. I said, that's another problem. You're trying to separate Jesus and God. He, Jesus said, me and the Father are one. He's just God in the flesh. That's it. When you see the Spirit of God, that's God in the Spirit who's manifest in, you know, within the, you know, if you see him here in the, um, within time and space. That's it. He's one. He's, he's a chad. This is what Shema is talking about. Hear, O Israel, Lord our God, Lord is one. That's it. This is the understanding of Israel, not he's in three different, all this, no, that just, that all came about in the church age. Not from biblical um, uh, understanding of Judaism. So, Again, we talk about why does he say the kingdom of God here? Because he doesn't want to use the holy name of God in vain. And then he continues here in verse 4. He kind of doubles down on this idea how blessed are those who mourn. Well, it's not a ble- it's, you're not blessed when you mourn. It's kind of the opposite, right? For, but they're blessed because when they go through the process of mourning, they will bring, be comforted. Thank you. I see that there. What's, what my, what's my time looking like? Okay, perfect. I'm, I've got a couple minutes. How blessed are the meek, for they will inherit not the earth. Okay, here we go. What are they going to inherit? Israel. It's Israel. Where does, see, this is the idea that people say, oh, well, we're going to die and go to heaven, and someone died and went to heaven. That's not biblical. It says, heaven is coming down to us. Heaven is coming to earth. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, there's coming a day when the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. And, and that day, heaven will be, uh, the earth will be like it is in heaven because heaven will be here. But the meek will inherit the land. And which land? Israel. Remember, everything is going back to a, a rectification and a tikkun to bring back what was lost in the garden. And this is why even there's this idea of all the work that needs to be done to, for seven years after these wars, that they're burning up weapons and whatnot. Why? Because God does just doesn't come down and snap his fingers and everything is perfect again. No, it takes a partnership with man to rectify these things, just like it was in the beginning. Adam and Eve, they didn't come into perfection. No, they came in and God said, it's very good. It was good. And here's the rake. Here's the hoe. Here are the clippers. Go and tend my garden. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, swords were beaten into plowshares and uh, nations not learn war again. That's around Revelation chapter 20-ish, I believe. 2021, I believe. Somewhere in there. You can find it. So it brings us down to verse 5. It says, How blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. 
So we come to the same thing, this idea of blessing. The word in the Hebrew is used as ashrei, which has this idea, um, the best I can describe it would be the idea of something meaningful or something worthwhile, something great, inside and outside of time and space, being given upon those, given to someone who is hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Just like a blessing you can't even think of. Just the, you, you think about the most wonderful thing you can think of, that's it. That awaits those who, not just do, the ones who hunger and thirst for it. Not just those who kind of, oh, you know, okay, maybe. No, those who hunger and thirst for it. And look what he connects it to, this idea of the, of the blessing. Are those who show mercy, they'll be shown mercy. If you don't show mercy, will you be shown mercy? No, it's not. a certain degree, because God is merciful, he can't help it. But when you're merciful, then there's something that is just greater than you can even imagine coming back to you. But that's not why, again, that's not why you do it, but that is the benefit of doing it, that you'll be shown mercy. How blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, who's he talking to here? He's talking to Israel. These are all the promises on Israel. What does that have to do with the Gentiles? Well, it's a good practice. If you show mercy, you'll be shown mercy. If you're grafted into the house of Israel, you're partakers of the blessing that the promises that are given to Israel, etc. See, this is that connection that the, the authentic right connection. The rabbis have always taught that women can attain a higher level of sanctification and understanding of Scripture too and relationship with, with Hashem. Um, which is a, a blessing because they don't deal with the same problems that men deal with. And they take on burdens and responsibility for mankind that men can't do. Um, and we even see that this, you know, in the idea that, look, you, did a man have anything to do with Messiah coming back? No, but a woman did in the natural within time and space. So you see these things of uh, how women can attain things that Men can't. One of them is creating life. Yeah. Well, I said with him being born, in the idea of, you know, it was Miriam, it was his wife with the father, with being over, overshadowed by the, the Ruach. And then we get to verse 9. How blessed are those who make peace, for they will be called the sons of God, B'nai Elohim. In Jewish understanding, when we see the words children, children or servants concerning Israel, what's the difference? This comes back to what you said. So you brought up something perfectly today. When they're doing the mitzvot, they're children. When they're doing evil, they're just servants. That's why you see these words come back and forth within Scripture. And again, verse 10, how blessed are those who are persecuted because they pursue righteousness for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And you see this idea of seeing God? If you put God's holy name in there, for the name is theirs. A relationship with God is theirs. And then how blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell you all kinds of vicious lies about you because you follow me? This is Yeshua telling them, you are blessed when people say evil things about you because you proclaim the name of Yeshua. And I want to camp out here for a quick second. He's referring to when other Jews would disown them or say evil things about them, in particular within their community, because they are followers and believers that Yeshua was the Messiah. That's a big deal. You know, you go to the synagogue on Shabbat and you're waiting for Messiah to come back and you say, oh, Yeshua's Messiah, and the majority doesn't believe that that's a problem. Now you're branded a heretic and you can get, you know, if we want to go to a local synagogue, we can't go in there and start talking about Yeshua. They will kick us out real quick. You may really literally kick you out, right? <laughs> and it's this idea. Where's it at here? 
this idea of the, na- the name of Yeshua, it's not talking about Jesus the Christ. What do I mean by that? Go to any church around here and say, oh, I love Jesus the Christ. And it's all wonderful. Go into most churches and say, I love Yeshua HaMashiach. They will brand you a heretic and want to kick you out. It's the name of Yeshua that has the power. We recognize that God recognizes the name of Jesus. We recognize that. But it's the name of Yeshua because it's, it's, it's Hebrew. Yeah. I know because you recognize that they don't. They recognize him as Jesus because they separate him from anything Jewish. They may not say it, but um, they act it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I'm around believers I have written here who are not Messianic, I say Jesus to meet them where they are, to keep them comfortable, that maybe buy me some time to be able to talk to them a little bit, and things are fine. But if I say Yeshua, things change and they tend to get uncomfortable really quick. So you've got to be careful what you're saying around, know people who you're talking to and where they are and just meet them there. And I'm saying all this to say in verse 12, or 22, excuse me, he says, you will be hated for my name's sake. What is his name? Yeshua. Yeshua. Is it anything else? No. When I go to Mexico, guess who they call me? Brent. I, have a ch- I, I do work with different uh, people in Asia. And what do they call me? Brent. I don't go to Mexico and they start calling me, I don't know, something that starts with a B. Bruno. Bruno. <laughs> no. You know. I, they call me Brent. I, I, God has one name. <laughs> this is why the holy name of God. He has titles. He has one name. Yeshua has one name. He has many titles. Everybody in the body of Messiah is happy about salvation, but few are happy about the implications of Judaism. And we have to present Messiah correctly. Amen? The people there on this day all had the the opportunity to receive him and later present him to other Jews and Gentiles in a correct manner. And then it ends here, Rejoice, be glad, because your reward in heaven is great. They also prosecute, or persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. The rewards we get, if we get anything, they're not for here. They're in heaven awaiting. We don't do it for that reason, but they're there. Now, that's the actual end. That's the first, the 12 verses that are part of today's Brit Hadashah reading. But I can't help but going to 13 through 16 and read it really quick. It says, you are the salt for the land. Or in some verses it says, you are the salt of the earth. Who is the salt of the earth? The Jewish people, Israel. And they're the salt of Israel. If Israel, if the, the Israel and the people of Israel, the Jews, are not salty, then they're tasteless to everybody else. They need to be salty. They need the salt so that they can spread the salt, so the Gentiles can receive that. But if they're not the salt then to Gentiles, we're stuck. We're waiting on them to be resalted. Yeah. I just had a thought when you were talking about that. Um, during the exile, when there was no uh, Jewish nation from 70 AD to the end of the time, so that's why Israel was all desperate to be Jewish people in the desert. Now that they're gone, it's not really true. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. And he continues in verse 13, but if the salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except for being thrown out for the people to trample on, which we've seen happen to Israel. How is it that Israel can be, the Jewish people can become salty again? Practice in Torah. And then they can teach Torah to the nations. Then they can be the light. All of these things are contingent upon Israel, not the church. And when the church figures that out, then they can actually do something to help Israel do it. It's called to do so everyone can benefit. Instead of trying to replace Israel and make up stuff and do something else. No. It hurts everyone. And we're seeing a great falling away happening right before our eyes. 
before our eyes. I know Christian folks, I used to go to church with years ago, they didn't want anything to do with God or anything. To, they're just out, you know, <laughs> worshiping other things, you know. Yeah, you're going to say, Case? No, okay. Likewise, and so again, Matthew 5, 14, he's talking to Jewish people. He says, you are the light of the world. The Jewish people are the light. Who is the world? The rest of the nations. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Likewise, when people light a lamp, you get this idea of a Shabbat candle. When it's lit, they don't cover it with a bowl, but put it on a lampstand so that it shines for everyone in the house to see. Everyone around to see. In the same way, let your light shine before people, for Gentiles, for others, so they may see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. This is the call of Israel, to let their light shine by doing the mitzvot so the Gentiles can see and do what? Praise God in heaven. Praise the, the uh, God of the Jews in heaven and come into the house of Israel. Our job right now is to help Israel get solid again by actually doing the mitzvot, by practicing Torah, and they see it, and they say, why are Gentiles doing that and we're not? Huh. You know, they're coming after our God. We need to go back to Torah, and show, we're supposed to show them exactly. So send someone Jewish to take my place. Wonderful. It's a great thing. Or to work alongside, whatever. That's fine. I'm trying to work myself out of a job. <laughs> Hallelujah. And again, I mentioned this, and I'm mentioning one more time. We need to want to know God by His rules, by what He says, not by what we think. And we can't look, this is a big thing among the nations, is to look for someone who does things our way, and then we follow that. Because we're in agreement with an error. Rather than the halakha of Israel, how Israel done it for thousands of years. That being said, is Israel perfect? No. Any father here, are you perfect? But you have the authority to set the tone and to make halakha in your own home, don't you? You've been given the authority by God. You're expected to. Same kind of an understanding. Anybody have any last thoughts or questions? No? Amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone who's watching. We'll see you next week.